Thank you, Zelda. And I'd like to thank uh, everybody at the Cleveland Clinic for inviting me uh, to speak. I'm a movement disorder doctor as well. I'm UNLV. One of the things I know you guys have heard about a lot today, and I'm going to mention again, is fatigue and sleepiness. And you've sat through a lot, so if you all want to stretch, you can, and then I'll start. But I'm going to talk about the uh, motor complications. Most of it is going to be the motor complications that occur with Parkinson's that give you symptoms that you might not associate with your Parkinson's disease. The last slide is going to be a little bit about other diseases and how they impact on uh, Parkinson's. And I should mention that ex with one exception, everything I'm going to mention is off-label. It's not FDA approved. So it's really not a Parkinson's talk without a slide like this. And uh, Dr. Blue had already put up a slide. But these are the cardinal motor symptoms of Parkinson's, right? The tremors, the rigidity, the slowness of movement, and the postural instability. Every Parkinson patient has a combination of these four to some degree. And this is what we usually think of as Parkinson's disease, right? Shaking, trouble walking. But I'm not going to talk about any of this stuff because uh, this isn't the, motor co the medical complications. This is the normal complications. So this is a, intentionally a busy slide. It shows you everything that can occur with Parkinson's. Now, the uh, pink circles and the arrows, these are the motor complications. These are the typical symptoms that we think of. The green circles, however, are all of the other things that occur. And I'm going to try to talk about all of these, except for the ones that have already been discussed, the psychiatric and cognitive ones. So what we're talking about here are what are called non-motor symptoms. Uh, th these are symptoms other than the classic motor symptoms. And oftentimes they're psychiatric, which you've heard about, autonomic, sensory, and sleep issues. And studies suggest that patients experience between 8 and 13, but some experience as many as 30. And uh, only a very small minority of patients have none of these symptoms. The quality of life, particularly as the disease progresses, is more dependent on these symptoms than on things like tremors and rigidity. And so you might say, well, if this is so common, why is the burden so high? And quite frankly, many doctors don't look for these. Uh, as I believe uh, Dr. Wint said, there are specific questions that we ask, but I think uh, non-movement disorder doctors may just think of the tremors and the rigidity. They're also not spontaneously reported by patients. Patients don't normally think, I have constipation, I should tell my neurologist about that. The other thing is, is that our current Parkinson medicines are pretty good for the Parkinson symptoms, but they don't really work particularly well for the non-motor symptoms. So I'm going to talk about the more common ones. There is multiple, multiple. I'm going to talk about the common ones that haven't already been discussed. Now, I know fatigue has already been discussed, but it's probably the most common one, so I'll talk a little bit about it again. It's extremely common. And in fact, it's the most common reason cited for disability in the United States. And as uh, Dr. Wint uh, already mentioned, it doesn't necessarily mean that the patient's depressed. Certainly, patients with depression have fatigue, but that's not um, the, that they don't have to. He already mentioned some of the treatments. You can try methylphenidate, amphetamine salts, modafinil and armodafinil, which are like provigil and new vigil. The results for these are pretty mixed. Now, several years ago in Houston, there was a very small study where they used sodium oxabate for excessive daytime sleepiness, and it showed benefit. And actually, this month, about two weeks ago, there was another report uh, with about 20 patients um, where it showed benefit. The problem is that sodium oxabate is extremely difficult to get clinically. It's FDA approved for narcolepsy, Clinically, it's very similar to rohypnol. If you're not sure what rohypnol is, it's the date rape drug. So very difficult to get, particularly off-label. But it does show some benefit. Orthostatic hypotension. This has already been discussed briefly uh, by Dr. Mari. And as he mentioned, it can occur from the medicines, but it's often part of the disease itself, particularly as the disease progresses. 
And what orthostatic, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is, is low blood pressure. And it may be in as many as 20% of patients. Again, it can be caused by the medicines, but it can be caused by the Parkinson's disease itself. The first line treatment is to get rid of your blood pressure medicines. Typically in the United States, people are put on blood pressure medicines and they're on them for the rest of their life. But in Parkinson's disease, patients start to shed these medicines. Now there is one FDA approved medicine for this. It's called Droxidopa. The brand name is Northera and it's a norepinephrine precursor. It's to norepinephrine what levodopa is to dopamine. And it's thought to work by converting uh, norepinephrine uh, per by peripheral vasoconstriction. There are other agents that we use, fludrocortisone, which is a form of a steroid, a mineral corticoid steroid, and mitodrin, which is a vasopressor antihypotensive agent, it's similar to the dopamine agonists, except norepinephrine. The main side effect of all three is supine hypertension. In other words, when you lie down, does your blood pressure go too high? Sexual dysfunction, very common in Parkinson's as well. Again, some of this can be associated with the Parkinson's disease medications. Some of it can be related to some of the other non-motor symptoms, such as depression. You can actually have an increase in libido with things like levodopa. You can have compulsive sexual behaviors with the dopamine agonists. And when you're managing this, don't forget about non-Parkinson issues. When I have uh, men that come to me with trouble with erectile dysfunction, before considering any medication, I have them see a urologist to make sure there's not a prostate issue, for instance. So in clinical trials, sildenafil, which is Viagra, has actually been shown to be effective in erectile dysfunction, and the other medicines also work. Interestingly, sildenafil also works for um, dyskinesias, but it would be a very expensive way to treat the dyskinesias. Pain. Pain is also very common and often not thought of as a Parkinson's symptom, but up to 75% of patients might experience pain. Now, some of it can be related to the motor symptoms, such as rigidity, the muscle stiffness. You can have dystonia, which is twisting of the muscles. Um, it's prolonged muscle contraction. Abdominal pain, which can be related to GI issues, which we'll get to. You can have musculoskeletal pain. You have decreased movement, postural issues, and falls, which all can cause achiness. And again, pain can also be related to the depression and other psychiatric issues. How do we treat pain? Well, first you want to optimize the Parkinson medicines. Patients are moving better, they probably have less pain. And if you optimize on time, there's probably less pain. Exercise and physical therapy can help. If it's dystonia or muscle spasm, you can give botulinum toxin, that can help. And certain medications can help. Some of the anti-inflammatories can sometimes help. The gabapentin type medicines, whether it's gabapentin or the other medicines that are like it, can help. We do try to avoid narcotics. These can cause cognitive problems. They're very bad at causing constipation, which is already a big issue. And there can be other issues as well. GI issues are probably the most, second most common thing after the fatigue that we see. And it frequently occurs even before the Parkinson's is diagnosed. In a study at the Mayo Clinic, a retrospective study where they went back and looked at charts, it seemed as though patients developed constipation as much as 20 years before they were diagnosed with Parkinson's. We have many non-medicinal recommendations. A lot of Parkinson's patients are probably relatively dehydrated, so we recommend drinking a lot of water. One thing that can help patients force them to drink water is I tell patients to put a pitcher of water in their fridge, and every time you pass the kitchen, you gotta pour one sitting. Certainly increasing fiber intake can help. Raw fruits and vegetables, exercise, and eliminating or at least reducing dairy can help. I personally love ice cream, so I don't think I could eliminate it completely, but you wanna at least reduce the intake. What about medications? You wanna use polyethylene glycol, it's, a lax it's an osmotic laxative. Basically causes water to come into your bowels and helps to try to relieve the constipation. There's a, a medicine called lupiprostone, I forget what the brand name is, it's a chloride channel, protein 2 activator. It also causes fluids to be secreted and it helps motility. The evidence for this is sort of so-so. 
There was a medicine that used to be on the market called Propulsid, Tegacerod, a very small study suggested benefit. This medicine was, was pulled because of EKG abnormalities. It's virtually impossible to get these days. Nausea, as Dr. Mori mentioned already, this is usually a result of the side effects of levodopa and the dopamine agonists. Um, but when you have reduced gastric motility, that can increase um, the risk of nausea as well. If you're on a dopamine agonist, taking it with food can help. Um, also, avoiding, if you don't take the levodopa with protein, it's gonna work better. It's more likely to go to the brain than to the stomach and you're less likely to get the nausea. But if you still have nausea with it, taking it with orange juice instead of water can help its absorption, can help reduce nausea. You can liquefy levodopa, and you can also um, take extra carbidopa. You can get carbidopa by itself to help with the nausea. I think I have that on the next slide. Yeah. So as far as medications that you might think would help nausea, there's a medicine called metuclopramide, which is Reglan, which is sometimes used for nausea. It's the worst medicine you could be on as a Parkinson patient. Metuclopramide works by antagonizing dopamine by going against dopamine, which is obviously what we don't want to do. Um, in fact, several times a year, I'll see somebody for Parkinson's disease who is on metuclopramide. We take them off the metuclopramide, the Parkinson's very slowly goes away. Um, domperidone works the same way as metuclopramide, but it doesn't get into the brain, so it can be very effective at preventing nausea. The problem is, is it's not available in the United States. Um, it's, not, it's just they never brought it to trial, so it, it's available in Canada. There is some potential QT prolongation, so if somebody's going to go on domperidone, they probably need an EKG beforehand. When I was in residency in Pittsburgh, uh, one of our physicians had a Canadian medical license, and occasionally we would uh, get them the patient's domperidone. Serotonin uh, receptor anta uh, antagonist. This is ondansetron or granucetron. Uh, the most common one that's used is Zofran, that's on Dancitron. This is very helpful in Parkinson's. It doesn't affect dopamine. However, if you're on medicines like apomorphine, you can't take these. So you gotta be careful if you're on uh, apomorphine. And as I just mentioned, don't forget about extra carbidopa. Um, it's, you know, pharmacies may tell you that they don't have it. They don't like to order it because it's not used a lot. But you can order extra carbidopa by itself to try to help get more levodopa to the brain. Sialuria, which is a fancy way of saying drooling. Drooling is very common in Parkinson's. About 70% of, excuse me, about 70 of patients have abnormal salivation. Now you might think it's from extra saliva production, but it's actually not from that. People with Parkinson's actually produce less saliva. They just don't swallow it as frequently. Without Parkinson's, you sort of subconsciously swallow throughout the day. With Parkinson's, the saliva tends to pool in the mouth. And most Parkinson's patients tend to sit forward, tend to sit forward, and so it follows gravity and there's drooling. Some patients sit more back and you get like a hairball feeling. <coughs> Type of that. So what I usually recommend first is actually chewing gum or hard candy. Because even though you'll produce more saliva, it forces you to swallow more frequently. Now there are some medications you can use. Glycoperolate, which is an anticholinergic, um, anti but doesn't get into the brain too much, can sort of thin the saliva. It's good for so excess saliva production, at least in the short term. In the long term, you do have to worry about dry mouth, going the other way, or urinary retention, constipation, some of these other anticholinergic symptoms. Sublingual atropine. So at, sublingual atropine is at, actually atropine eye drops that we tell you to put on the corner of your mouth. These are the eye drops that sort of uh, make your pupils big so you can't see when you're getting your eyes examined. You can put them in the corner of your mouth, they'll dry your mouth out a little bit. This is not something you can do regularly because you'll have trouble thinking and delirium, hallucinations, but let's say you just needed it for public speaking like tonight. You could do it sort of once a month, a couple times a month. Uh, botulinum toxin actually works very well. Inject it sort of into the jaw, it can uh, sort of reduce uh, the saliva production. 
We tend to use the one with the brand name Myoblock, which tends to have more of a dry mouth than Botox, but either of them will work. And if it works, it lasts for about three months, and then you have to get the shots again, usually. Hyperhidrosis, which is excessive sweating. Uh, what, ha what happens is, is there's actually decreased sweating in the hands, but increase in the face, the head, and the trunk. And it can cause real drenching of clothes. And this can either be an on or an off symptom. If it's an off symptom, the treatment is keep the, get the patient on, give them more levodopa, other medicines, keep them on. If it's an on symptom, if patient's on but they still have the drenching sweating, there really aren't any good treatments that I know of. You may have heard of using Botox for sweating. That's for underarm sweating. This is sweating all over the body. Uh, Botox really doesn't work for that. And unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, there are no good treatments. So we already talked about REM sleep behavior disorder. Now this is a video, as I mentioned, you act out your dream. Normally you're paralyzed when you're asleep, but you're gonna see what happens. This guy is asleep. Imagine if you're sleeping in the bed next to him. Needless to say, it's usually the bed partner that complains, not the patient, unless the patient is throwing himself out of bed or or hitting his head against the, the headboard. Again, he's asleep during all of this. Um, and it, it can occur prior to diagnosis. You don't have to have Parkinson's disease to have this, but most patients do. And as, uh, as Dr. Wintory mentioned, clonazepam and melatonin can be very helpful. Again, it's usually the bed partner who complains. You can actually go on YouTube. I mean, I don't know if you've seen this. I've seen videos of dogs when they're sleeping, like running into the wall. These are dogs with REM sleep behavior disorder. My last slide again is comorbid medical problems. So, people. So, what if you don't really have many of these, but you might have other medical conditions? How do these affect the Parkinson's? Well, this has been looked at to some degree, and actually, arthritis and respiratory disease have the worst effect on quality of life scales. Um, the next thing that's worse is emergency department visits. Interestingly though, it's emergency department visits where patients were not admitted, seem to have more of a quality of life impairment than if you get admitted. I'm not quite sure why that is, but anyway. Heart disease and diabetes show some impact, but it's less, certainly less than the other ones. Interestingly, cancer and Parkinson's don't seem to correlate with quality of life issues. The treatment is obviously to maximize treatment of the comorbidities. If somebody has diabetes, you want to treat the diabetes. If they have arthritis, you got to treat the arthritis. Anyway, this is my last slide. I don't think I used all my time, so I figured I was the last speaker, so people would be getting sleepy. But to summarize, Parkinson's is more than just a motor disease of tremors and rigidity. We have good medicines for the motor symptoms. We're beginning to have better medicines for the non-motor symptoms. And don't forget to talk to your doctor about these non-motor symptoms. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. We're going to uh, have a brief uh, panel question and answer session now. Uh, One sitting. Certainly increasing fiber intake can help. Raw fruits and vegetables, exercise, and eliminating or at least reducing dairy can help. I personally love ice cream, so I don't think I could eliminate it completely, but you want to at least reduce the intake. What about medications? You want to use polyethylene glycol, it's, a lax it's an osmotic laxative. Basically causes water to come into your bowels and helps to try to relieve the constipation. There's a, a medicine called lupiprostone, I forget what the brand name is. It's a chloride channel, protein 2 activator. It also causes fluids to be secreted and it helps motility. The evidence for this is sort of so-so. There was a medicine that used to be on the market called Propulsid, Tegacerod, a very small study suggested benefit. This medicine was, was pulled because of EKG abnormalities. It's virtually impossible to get these days. 
nausea. As Dr. Mori mentioned already, this is usually a result of the side effects of levodopa and the dopamine agonists. Um, but when you have reduced gastric motility, that can increase um, the risk of nausea as well. If you're on a dopamine agonist, taking it with food can help. Um, also, avoiding, if you don't take the levodopa with protein, it's gonna work better. It's more likely to go to the brain than to the stomach and you're less likely to get the nausea. But if you still have nausea with it, taking it with orange juice instead of water can help its absorption, can help reduce nausea. You can liquefy levodopa, and you can also um, take extra carbidopa. You can get carbidopa by itself to help with the nausea. I think I have that on the next slide. Yeah. So as far as medications that you might think would help nausea, there's a medicine called me too clopramide, which is Reglan which is sometimes used for nausea, it's the worst medicine you could be on as a Parkinson patient. Me too clopramide works by antagonizing dopamine, by going against dopamine, which is obviously what we don't want to do. Um, in fact, several times a year, I'll see somebody for Parkinson's disease who is on me too clopramide. We take them off the me too clopramide, the Parkinson's very slowly goes away. Um, Domperidone works the same way as me too clopramide, but it doesn't get into the brain, so it can be very effective at preventing nausea. The problem is, is it's not available in the United States. Um, it's, not, it's just they never brought it to trial, so it, it's available in Canada. There is some potential QT prolongation, so if somebody's gonna go on domperidone, they probably need an EKG beforehand. When I was in residency in Pittsburgh, uh, one of our physicians had a Canadian medical license, and occasionally we would uh, get them the patient's down paradigm. Serotonin uh, receptor anta uh, antagonist. This is ondansetron or granucetron. Uh, the most common one that's used is Zofran. That's ondansetron. This is very helpful in Parkinson's. It doesn't affect dopamine. However, if you're on medicines like apomorphine, you can't take these. So you got to be careful if you're on uh, apomorphine. And as I just mentioned, don't forget about extra carbidopa. Um, it's, you know, pharmacies may tell you that they don't have it. They don't like to order it because it's not used a lot. But you can order extra carbidopa by itself to try to help get more levodopa to the brain. Sialuria, which is a fancy way of saying drooling. Drooling is very common in Parkinson's. About 70% of, excuse me, about 70 of patients have abnormal salivation. Now you might think it's from extra saliva production but it's actually not from that. People with Parkinson's actually produce less saliva, they just don't swallow it as frequently. Without Parkinson's, you sort of subconsciously swallow throughout the day. With Parkinson's, the saliva tends to pool in the mouth. And most Parkinson's patients tend to sit forward, tend to sit forward, and so it follows gravity and there's drooling. Some patients sit more back and you get like a hairball feeling. <coughs> Type of that. So what I usually recommend first is actually chewing gum or hard candy. Because even though you'll produce more saliva, it forces you to swallow more frequently. Now there are some medications you can use. Glycoperolate, which is an anticholinergic, um, anti but doesn't get into the brain too much, can sort of thin the saliva. It's good for so excess saliva production, at least in the short term. In the long term, you do have to worry about dry mouth, going the other way or urinary retention, constipation, some of these other anticholinergic symptoms. Sublingual atropine. So at, sublingual atropine is at, actually atropine eye drops that we tell you to put on the corner of your mouth. These are the eye drops that sort of uh, make your pupils big so you can't see when you're getting your eyes examined. You can put them in the corner of your mouth, they'll dry your mouth out a little bit. This is not something you can do regularly because you'll have trouble thinking and delirium, hallucinations. But let's say you just needed it for public speaking, like tonight. You could do it sort of once a month, a couple times a month. Uh, botulinum toxin actually works very well. Inject it sort of into the jaw. It can uh, sort of reduce uh, the saliva production. We tend to use the one with the brand name Myoblock, which tends to have more of a dry mouth than Botox, but either of them will work. And if it works, it lasts for about three months, and then you have to get the shots again, usually. 
Hyperhidrosis, which is excessive sweating. Uh, what, ha what happens is, is there's actually decreased sweating in the hands, but increase in the face, the head, and the trunk. And it can cause real drenching of clothes. And this can either be an on or an off symptom. If it's an off symptom, the treatment is keep the, get the patient on, give them more levodopa, other medicines, keep them on. If it's an on symptom, if patient's on but they still have the drenching sweating, there really aren't any good treatments that I know of. You may have heard of using Botox for sweating. That's for underarm sweating. This is sweating all over the body. Uh, Botox really doesn't work for that. And unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, there are no good treatments. So we already talked about REM sleep behavior disorder. Now this is a video, as I mentioned, you act out your dream. Normally you're paralyzed when you're asleep, but you're gonna see what happens. This guy is asleep. Imagine if you're sleeping in the bed next to him. Needless to say, it's usually the bed partner that complains, not the patient, unless the patient is throwing himself out of bed or or hitting his head against the, the headboard. Again, he's asleep during all of this. Um, and it, it can occur prior to diagnosis. You don't have to have Parkinson's disease to have this, but most patients do. And as, uh, as Dr. Wintory mentioned, clonazepam and melatonin can be very helpful. Again, it's usually the bed partner who complains. You can actually go on YouTube. I mean, I don't know if you've seen this. I've seen videos of dogs when they're sleeping, like running into the wall. These are dogs with REM sleep behavior disorder. My last slide again is comorbid medical problems. So, people. So, what if you don't really have many of these, but you might have other medical conditions? How do these affect the Parkinson's? Well, this has been looked at to some degree, and actually, arthritis and respiratory disease have the worst effect on quality of life scales. Um, the next thing that's worse is emergency department visits. Interestingly though, it's emergency department visits where patients were not admitted, seem to have more of a quality of life impairment than if you get admitted. I'm not quite sure why that is, but anyway. Heart disease and diabetes show some impact, but it's less, certainly less than the other ones. Interestingly, cancer and Parkinson's don't seem to correlate with quality of life issues. The treatment is obviously to maximize treatment of the comorbidities. If somebody has diabetes, you want to treat the diabetes. If they have arthritis, you got to treat the arthritis. Anyway, this is my last slide. I don't think I used all my time, so I figured I was the last speaker, so people would be getting sleepy. But to summarize, Parkinson's is more than just a motor disease of tremors and rigidity. We have good medicines for the motor symptoms. We're beginning to have better medicines for the non-motor symptoms. And don't forget to talk to your doctor about these non-motor symptoms. So thank you. <laughs>